Kara Atia is born into an Algerian family in Paris and spent his childhood between France and Algeria. He then studied philosophy, particularly close to Jacques Rancière, um, and came to art. His work tackles the increasingly difficult relationship between Europe and immigrants, particularly those of Islamic faith. He gained international recognition at the 50th Venice Biennale in 2003, as well as at the Lyon Biennale in 2005, where he exhibited the legendary work Flying Rats, which was an installation of life-side, brought seeds sculptures of children being devoured by a flock of pigeons. His recent exhibitions include the Havana Biennale, the Sydney Biennial, La Force de l'Art, which is the Paris Triennial, and he's more and more also connected to architecture. So we had a long uh, public conversation, actually, at Teresa Glados Falmouth uh, um, convention earlier this year, which had a lot to do uh, as a long interview about uh, Kada's connection to architecture and urbanism. He did a very amazing piece recently in um, uh, Oslo, which was actually connected to Corbusier, it's called Garaya, and he has a connection between Corbusier and Couscous. A very warm welcome to Kaderatia. Thank you. Thank you, Anselm Riff. Thank you. Thank you, all the crew of the Serpentine, for the invitation to talk. Thank, to, thank you for the audience that is coming on Sunday. We're going to start, uh, actually, by this, this representation I did. Um, which actually re refer on what I would call the process of um, ideologies in this era of post-ideologies, or nobody really knows now, um, works. I'm going to read this short text uh, and then show you a different example. From art to war, the era of modernity has been the celebration of new, new dogmas almost religions, ideologies. At the end of the 80s, communism falling down in Europe made that the occidental thought started to claim the end of ideologies and the clash of civilization. But what is exactly the era where we live in? Alain Badiou, a French philosopher, wrote in his article published a few days after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, entitled, De quoi cette crise est-elle le spectacle? which means from what this crisis is the spectacle. According to him, the hand of ideologies is over. We need to go back to the ID, he said. What he meant by ID is clearly that we need to read again Karl Marx's ideas and project. I think he was both wrong and right, actually. Actually, the world we are living in has always been look, looking for a new ID. But at the same time, the belief in ideologies based on their terminology is over. We have many examples. Who would say 30 years ago that China's socialism will be the ground of capitalization of this, this country? Who would say that Obama, a Democrat uh, president, has uh, what he's doing now, now? He has never stopped the war in Afghanistan. The contrary, he sent more and more soldiers. It's only in France that things never change. Sarkozy policies with the left wing was a short romance, almost an affair. He's now back in his very French behavior. behavior. Nothing has to change. Whereas the rest of the world has changed. And the world changes every day. Why? Because today, at this post-postmodern era, I would quote Achille Mbembe, the oversaturation of daily news about the world has created an ephemeral behavior of ethic. The next day make the first one obsolete, and whatever we claim from politics to science, from sexuality to spirituality, from art to war, anything we do work with its contrary, its paradox. I do not believe in Badiou nostalgic concept of going back to communist ID, but we need in the West to open new all eyes in a critical insight of our current time by the archaeology of modernity. For this, I present here a series of pictures how the most interesting project of modernity has become the worst. Why, and in which way it, paradox it paradoxically brought good things. I've started many years ago to focus on all the, 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 the what we called in France les grands ensembles, the great project of urbanization in which I actually share my time where, where, when I grew up between France and, 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 and Algeria. My always, I mean, my fascination was, was 
I mean, strangely, by one material, the concrete. And actually, what's happened, the more I was researching the, this origin, this reason d'être, the raison d'être of these materials and the way it has been globalized by modernity, I discovered very interesting things. It actually that, it, it, it was that actually, uh, if we do an archaeology of modernity, especially about aesthetic in architecture, there, there is an interesting phenomenon that happened there, especially in the beginning of the, of the, of the 20th century. Of course, today, what we know about the concrete is, as I said, sort of mixed of order and emotion. At that point, we have the... the, 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 the we, we, I could refer directly to Le Corbusier, but many ways, like this very strange installation that closed a neighborhood of Algiers made by the socialist government in the 70s has this kind of paradoxical order and emotion. But what, what, what is very interesting is to go beyond this concrete uh, hegemony and understand how it became and why it became uh, globalized. The first social housing that has been built in Algeria was built by Fernand Pouillon, an architect that we will talk about later. As you can see in these pictures, the buildings are made with stones. It actually, it's a very important detail, actually, because Fernand Pouillon, at the end of, of his life, spent three years in jail because he decided very early to go against the, the, the using of concrete. So what's happened here is that if you focus on this, this architecture that are social housing in Algiers built in the beginning of the 50s, you will understand how much the relation with what we could call uh, the archaeology of, modernism, of modern aesthetic has to do with North Africa. I like to speak about this story of Le Corbusier arriving in Algiers in, 19, uh, 20, in 1929 and then 1930, giving lectures in, at the, the, the architecture departments of, the, of Algiers University and actually starting to, to watch and, 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 and walk in the Kasbah and in this very interesting city called Gardaia. It's very interesting to speak here in London about this story because actually I, I remember that last year there was an exhibition about Le Corbusier, very important one, and I just have to admit that it's, it's insane that in this exhibition there were just one postcard about Gardaia. Gardaia is the city in which Le Corbusier has spent more than seven weeks taking, taking pictures, doing drawings. We have all the bibliography about this, but nobody, especially the Fondation Le Corbusier, wants to talk about this. I'm going to show you pictures like this one of La Chapelle de Ronchamp, the first masterpiece of Le Corbusier that he built when he arrived, when he was back from Algeria in France. The Chapelle de Ronchamp, especially the walls, has a lot of to do with the city of Gardaia that you can discover in these pictures. The, especially the process of what Le Corbusier put in his manifesto, La Chartre d'Athènes, the free facade. The free facade is the idea that the facade of a building is flat and windows. I mean, by the way, never in, really invented something at that point, because the first one who spoke about this was Adolf Luz in his amazing essay uh, on a mountain crimes. So, following this, the story I'm, I'm, I'm telling you now, you just need to make the relation between this Algerian city, absolutely lost in the middle of the Sahara, in which a both Muslim and Jews community have lived together during uh, eighth century, building a world that the, the, the genius of modernity of, in architecture, Le Corbusier, discovered beginning of the 30s. And you can obviously make the analogy between not only the shape of the buildings, but also the functionality of this architecture. So this presentation I'm, I'm doing here as a, both a searcher and an artist is just to create a real focus on what I called the amnesia of art history and especially in architecture. All these houses that you are watching now, like this one that has been built in the middle of the 19th century in Gardaia, you just could imagine what was the reaction of Le Corbusier in front of this building beginning of the 30s. 
What is interesting in this, in, in, in this disco world that many, I mean, I have to admit that many architects know, it's what will be the following. Because Le Corbusier did an amazing project. I mean, okay, he copied Gardaia, as we can see, you can see here. That's why I created this piece, which is actually the couscous I offered to Le Corbusier and Fernand Pouillon in the museum. And actually, the, the, the idea is always to go beyond the, 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 the historical fact in order to improve the, the uh, I mean, just the, the knowledge of it and maybe understand more the future. So, the, 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 the next step of this, of this sort of appropriation by the genius of Le Corbusier is to understand uh, beyond, I mean before, from where this totally, absolutely lost aesthetic came. And actually, I would, I would, I would say that this, oh my God, it's very short. I, I would say that uh, this, com I mean, what we could call the Afro-Arab aesthetic came from the, the, the area of the Middle East, especially many places. I don't know if you, I mean, sure that people know Shiban, the city of the nine floors building built 2,000 years ago in Yemen that people, some, some connoisseurs called the Manhattan of the desert. I think we should call it, we should call Manhattan the Shiban of the North because I think this has been built 2,000 years before. So what I call the Afro-Arab architecture, and I'm sorry, but I'm going to make it faster, is all the relation that this architecture and the sub-Saharan architecture has been mixed in Gardaia to bring something. The, the first architect I told you before, Fernand Pouillon, here, has, been, has had a second life where he actually really developed and, and he took the inspiration of this architecture in Algeria to really reinvent something. And unfortunately, he was not as lucky as Le Corbusier because nobody really knows him. What Fernand Pouillon did, he just prepared the ground for this amazing movement that, I'm sorry if you know very well, Team 10. And actually, it's very fascinating because especially these, these buildings that exi still exist in Algiers, called 200 Columns. I mean, Ferrand, Ferrand Pouillon, obviously, as you can see in this building, was influenced by the architecture of the, of the desert by Gardaia. But what I like very much, like Le Corbusier and, and, and... What I like very much with Ferrand Pouillon is that he actually really adapt, invent, created an aesthetic that has to do with this Afro-Arab architecture. This is a marketplace, place, for instance. This, this is the beginning of what I would say Team 10. Here, Team 10, who focused on this idea of the reappropriation that I use in an, a piece called Caspar, this Team 10 has really invented, and I'm very happy to show you this also now, the idea that a Medina, a traditional Arab city, could be vertical. So look at this. This was the first project that was done in, in Casablanca as a vertical city. So it's, it's always fascinating to, to, to present work, especially as critic of modernity, like, like many artists do, many, many curators. But I have to admit that if this lecture has to do with the beginning, the drawing in which everything is mixed, is that modernity, I mean, brought wrong and good things. And in this idea, I mean, especially this reinterpretation of the, of the, of the local uh, behaviors and couture and, 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 and materials also in modern architecture is very interesting. In this picture, you can also, by the way, see Hassan Fathi, the Egyptian, we could say the, Le Cor the Egyptian Le Corbusier, who is uh, watching uh, from uh, Cameroonese houses, a Mosgum case. And here, I'm very happy to finish the lecture with this, and here, the, the, uh, a series of houses that I shooted in Senegal that also have, for me, in the continuity of the project of TM10. So, just to finish with this sort of what some people call the colonial modern, even for the best project, like this Niemeyer at Constantine University in Algeria, maybe I think I heard that it is for him his best project. Thank you very much.